I mix it up. So the next speaker is Dr. Mark Chiu, um, Associate Director at Janssen Research and Development, in Raritan, New Jersey, USA, to talk about updates on the development of self-assembling bispecific antibodies. Maybe this is forward? Okay. And this is um, pointer. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Reepsal, and thank you for the organizers for this opportunity to talk about the application of self-assembling bispecific antibodies and to try to follow the theme that was presented in the last few days. I'm going to present aspects of the clinical challenge, how we're going to address those challenges, and how we are going to apply the application of self-assembling antibodies some of the aspects of the avidity that takes place when you combine having multi-specific components, which is a major theme, how we have to think about that aspect of development and ongoing progress that you want to move on on. The th challenge that we often have is that if you take an example of cancer, cancer exists in a very polydispersed nature, there are lots of different kinds of cells, lots of different factors. There's a changing environment gradient that takes place. So any single kind of therapy often is not sufficient to address that kind of a situation. The best kind of thinking that we have right now is that you do have to think of having multiple targeting so that you can have the ability to control uncontrolled growth in a case of cancer. But I would claim this theme of polypharmacology is also critical on just thinking about cancer. That theme of being able to address different aspects is a critical component. So if you take the example of cancer, one of the primary markers lies in an excess or aberrant epidermal growth factor receptor growth, EGFR. A lot of the primary technologies in terms of using small molecules or large molecules to target this one particular receptor works for a short while, but it, doesn't, it stops being effective, primarily because of the induction of resistance coming up, that desire of the cell to continue to grow often results in different kinds of pathways to get activated, one of which is associated with the CMET pathway. This is the receptor for a hepatocyte growth factor. And here, the concepts of having that escape mechanism comes into play. So in thinking in a very naive fashion, if we can now shut down EGFR, shut down CMET, you'd have a better approach in, in terms of trying to deal with this problem of cancer. And we focused, in this case, the applications for lung cancer. There's some interesting aspects about the CMET receptor. This is a receptor that has that potential of coming together and forming higher order aggregates. So if you take an antibody that is bivalent, it will actually cause the receptors to come together and you'll have just the opposite effect of trying to shut things down. You will actually induce the better growth of the cancer. So in terms of this kind of targeting, you need to have an antibody that is monovalent with regards to the engagement with the CMET receptor. And if you can also have the other part of the arm target the EGFR protein, you now have a way of combating cancer by shutting down two receptors associated with growth and bypassing potential resistance. So the application. Antibodies have a natural way of having self-assembly. Human IgG4, a particular subtype, will undergo an exchange process. And it happens rather rapidly within the body with the particular conditions within the serum. This is not well controlled. In fact, you have a wide distribution of these multi-specific, in this case, red and yellow specificities. And you can multiply that in great numbers. So you can't really control what will be taking place. What we wanted to do was take an opportunity of working with GenMap over in Utrecht. They had the technology in which they identify particular point mutations so that if you took an antibody with green specificity, an antibody with blue specificity, go through a process of reduction and oxidation, and now you're able to self-assemble this bispecific agent. The choice of the point mutations allows for the greater stabilization of, no, sorry, greater stabilization of this bispecific agent, and the nature of how the complementary takes place allows that 
the thermodynamics of having the bispecific is a lot more stable than the individual components. So this is our tool. The mechanism by which we identify the bispecific antibody has some very interesting aspects associated with the avidity when you have a multi-specific component. And there are different mechanisms which are highlighted here. The first thing, if you're going to be targeting the receptors, the first thing you got to do is prevent that receptor from binding the respective ligands. And in this case, the antibody is able to block and when it binds onto the receptor for ligand engagement. Same thing for the cement. In this case, all in a monovalent fashion, so you don't have the potential of activation. They all bind tighter than the respective ligands. Because these are bispecific, you can in fact have an avidity when you have both receptors on that cell surface. So the engagement of one arm allows you to have a better response for the other arm. So I'll take you an example, show you an example. If you're going to be looking at phosphorylation, a typical thing you would do is you take the cells, add the ligand, you have induction of phosphorylation, you add in your molecule of interest, and when you have activity, you shut down that level of phosphorylation. If you now take a cell line that has a particular cell density of the respective receptors, okay, what you can see is that in the, if you look at EGFR phosphorylation, you take CMET, has nothing to do with that phosphorylation profile. You take EGFR, you have some level of engagement, but with a bispecific, you have something that's quite similar. But this is not so surprising because in this case, you have a lot more EGFR receptor than a CMET receptor. So everything is driven by the EGFR number. If you now take another cell line that has a different profile of EGFR versus CMET, that different ratio, what you will see is again, that theme for uh, CMET, you don't have much of an activity. For the EGFR monospecific, you have a particular profile. But with the bispecific, you do have a better effect because in this case, you have a cell line that has a lot more CMET receptor that allows you to bring in the engagement for the EGFR. You can do the flip of this. The flip of this is that you can look at CMET phosphorylation. If this is a cell, add the ligand, you have phosphorylation. You then add in the respective agents. The EGFR agent doesn't have much activity. The CMET has a particular profile, but you make it bispecific, you might have a much stronger effect because here what you're doing is you're allowing the EGFR engagement to help shut down cement response. You do the same thing too with a similar cell line, and you can see that in this case where you have a similar particular profile of receptor density, this nature of engagement for avidity, there's not much of a change in that profile of potency. You can also show this in terms of justifying that this kind of multi-specific is important. This, in this case here, you have um, looking at a downstream signaling profile, you have a profile for EGFR monospecific, the same thing for the CMET. When you have a combination of the two together, you have better improvement of shutting things down. But with the bispecific, you have a much stronger response, telling us that that ability of the avidity is a little bit better. So the other thing that we notice in terms of this nature of an antibody, we design the choice of the epitope so that you have that aspect of opsonization that was mentioned earlier. That internalization shuts things down stronger. The other thing that you can do is also take that ability of having the antibody where you can change the glycosylation profile in this fucose so that you will have, in fact, a stronger kind of a self-defined antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity profile. You can do these kinds of experiments showing that if you're looking at tumor reduction in an animal model, if you have the molecule shut things, things better, if you make the FC more silent, you lose some of that particular profile. So in the self-assembly from the discovery to development, what we then more or less applied were the standard antibody technologies where you have two cell lines, you make the respective proteins that you purify, and you undergo that process of that reduction oxidation using a particular reducing agent. And we're able to use a lot of the standard technologies that antibodies could be used to generate large quantities of these kinds of molecules. The first step in terms of the CMC efforts was to try to define the kinetic mechanism so that by knowing the particular rate constants, you can then plug in to the scale-up process 
in terms of understanding how each of the individual components go through the dissociation and reassociation process. There's a lot of effort that's associated with trying to understand what the best profile of the reducing temperature conditions, concentration conditions, so that you can map out what that particular space, so we can justify to the regulatory agencies we have control of the respective process. We have routinely shown that these bispecific antibodies that self-assemble are relatively stable with regards to having a monodispersed species. And one of the things that is unusual about having this reduction oxidation process is that you do have to justify that you do not disrupt any of the intrinsic disulfides that are present. So there's a lot of the confirmation of whether there are any free thiols, whether there's any potential of swapping between the blue and the green components in the light chain, and you have to make sure that there's no changes in the disulfide patterns. And there's an extensive series of critical quality attributes that you more or less have to focus on that side there. So in summary, we have a bispecific that we have that uses the technology of self-assembly, a lot of the aspects of making sure that we understand the structure function, superiority of a bispecific versus the combination has to be ascertained. This is going into phase two right now. We're quite unfortunate in terms of seeing, being able to deliver this to the patients to see how that works out right now, and we're quite excited. I only showed you in this particular instance in which we use a bispecific technology in which you shut down two particular targets, one of the other technologies that we're experimenting with is having the ability of the bispecific antibody bring together different classes of effector cells, be that with T cells as a competitor with the CAR-T technology or with the applications of other immune cells. So those are works that are ongoing. We're also exploring the different possibilities of having bispecific technologies bring in different kinds of toxic payloads. So, this work, of course, is something that takes a village to do. A lot of the discovery components in terms of how we look at this, how we want to think about the particular applications, the dosing strategies, and we're very fortunate to be able to work together with other companies to move this forward. So in conclusion, thank you very much for your attention and hope to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions on the floor? Please. So, uh, very interesting talk. So, I wonder why the antibody is, uh, excuse me, uh, IgG1 uh, type. So, you don't, you don't want complement dependent site toxicity from this antibody, I understand. In, in this case, we do want to have both complement and ADCC, the antibody dependent cytotoxicity. We want to use that host immune system, the patient's immune system, to kill off the cancer. By having the bispecific, you can target primarily only the tumor tissue because in normal skin tissue, you don't have such a high EGFR and cement content. Only with lung cancer where you have those two high receptor content will you have the activity. What I mean is the IgG1 type is not a strong complement activator as uh, IgG2A, for example. So that, that's correct. So what we did was engineer the FC that have a low fucose content so to enhance that ADCC and this, oh, okay. the CDC activity. Okay. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, Please. Yeah, I may miss the important information. So, but my question is, so you say both of the EGFR and the CMAT, they highly express in the certain type of tumors. But my question is, how closely are the two proteins in the cell membranes? So have you mapping that uh, they are really close. For, for me, if one of the arm bent to one, so maybe silence, the other one may not work as you proposed. It has to have, you could say, cis engagement. Like in, it has to be close proximity. In some of the model experiments, the choice of our antibodies have particular epitopes that allow for engagement for the EGFR and CMET. When those antibodies bind on, what's interesting is that it prevents EGFR and CMET from engaging with other HER family members. So there's something special about that choice of how we have that binding on. But yes, it must be close together to have that activity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so.